but still talking about the greater good. And now we're talking about uh, AI in the healthcare, if something that, you know, we all affected by. And that's why I'm super proud <laughs> to have Suchi Saria, the founder and CEO of Bayesian Health with us. Since yesterday, Bayesian Health is on the Forbes AI list 50. So congratulations, uh, Suchi. But uh, there is so, many, so much she's done in research, developed next generation diagnostic treatment planning using statistical machine learning methods. Um, she has served as an advisor for several Fortune 500 companies, worked and funded by leading organizations. Uh, she's won IEEE AI's 10 to watch, uh, top 50 in digital health, modern healthcare, and I don't want to take all the time for all your awards, <laughs> Suchi. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. Hi, Suchi. Hi. Thanks for Hi. having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. How are you today? How is the, very, how's the U.S.? Uh, very good. I'm at this like in meeting with a lot of uh, healthcare, uh, you know, leaders who are discussing kind of what does the next ten years look like with the amount of progress that we're seeing in machine learning AI. So it's uh, an interesting you know, very interesting to see sort of where their challenges are, what they're struggling with, but also how do they, you know, like one in three staff are leaving the workforce. So there's like a real staff crunch here and there's real need. So it's, uh, and safety is critical in domains like healthcare. So you can't just go wild and do things uh, that are not validated or, so I think the next couple of years will be very exciting to see how AI gets integrated safely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, we asked this question to everyone, Suchi, why and what what makes you fascinated about AI? How what what is it? Oh, um, that one. <laughs> so I got into the field when I was quite young, almost a little over twenty years ago. It wasn't. I I mean, um, I grew up in India. Was uh, very much sort of a builder engineer type. It's not taboo to be a nerd in India, as much as it is here as a kid. And uh, I went to this crazy science feeder school where they had a robotics club and got into robotics. Um, and from there, it was just, uh, you know, the more it, it was just really, really fun to see how you could use um, math and science and statistics to start building intelligent systems. It was just like a really fun, hard problem to solve. Um, did that for a long time, like, you know, first was in hardware, got increasingly more interested in the software. And then I guess at some point I had an early midlife crisis, if you will, in the sense of like, was at Stanford, I felt like a lot of the work we, I was doing and the field was doing overall in machine learning AI, this is around 2006, seven, eight, started to feel like, you know, much of it was in advertising, in fun games, but there just wasn't, you know, and I felt like there was such an opportunity to start making impact in hard fields that really needed solutions. At the time, it turns out like, uh, you know, we were going through a revolution where the U.S. was going to start digitizing health records, going from paper records to electronic records, which means you're going to ha start having an explosion of data. And so happened to be in an early group where we were funded on a moonshot project to start developing methods, foundational AI, ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning methods for this kind of like longitudinal data, um, started looking at modeling data from babies, like premature babies, like could you model which babies at risk for complications using all the data we already collect today, but we mostly throw away. And so that's sort of how I got into healthcare. And uh, yeah, and since then, uh, you know, got recruited Hopkins and have worked in both foundational AI, uh, machine learning technology, but also really thinking about how do we make it useful in domains like healthcare, where the data are very messy, safety is critical, you really need it to be, to be adopted, to be trusted by expert stakeholders. Like there are a new set of challenges that's different from other areas that am I, historically machine learning has been used um, and uh, have also been working a whole lot on, you know, uh, safety as you translate these applications from the lab to the real world. Super interesting, and, and you were covering already a couple of things where you said, like, this should be available to the entire world. Suchi, tell me, why are your innovative models not, you know, available to the broad mass already? Where, where are the critical factors? What's, what's going on there? I think um, there's a number of different ways to think about it. So 
machine learning, like AI as a whole, has been making very, very, very rapid progress in the last 10 years. The field is, I mean, even though it's much more sexy now and the media talks about it a lot, the progress has been amazing and very steadily accelerating over the last decade. Um, there are some areas where we've managed to push technology out in the real world, like self-driving cars. Tough area, yet, you know, we're, we're seeing, it's a hard area, but we're seeing consistent progress. Um, in other areas, like, uh, you know, if you even look at chatbots pre-chat GPT, that we've had a collection of chatbots like Tay that came out, if you remember, four or five years, four-ish years ago, um, immediately was tabooed because it said things that were, you know, critical and started, uh, like humans started mucking around with it and teaching it bad language. And then Taya was mimicking these bad humans. So before you know, you were in this like bad loop, right? But then like AI for creative work, I mean, that's been well in the making with, you know, Dolly being probably one of the most flashy versions of that, um, that came out three years ago. And from there on, there's been such rapid progress. So in, in, in healthcare in particular, as an area, passion area of mine, um, Similarly, I, I'd say like, there's just more ingredients you need to make sure that everything you're doing actually makes sense. And then, so, you know, it's all the way from, you need the underlying infrastructure to be able to collect that kind of data. This data is very sensitive. So you need the ability to do it in a way that you know is secure, compliant. You need, the technology needs to be like built up for like not just one type of data, but like hundreds of, you know, in healthcare, we have hundreds of different types of sensory data or sensory modalities, as opposed to saying, you know, when chatbots are training, they're mostly training on text data, but you have text and you have longitudinal streams of like numbers and discrete streams of numbers. So like very broadly multimodal. And so training models for that kind of data, you know, how do you account for biases where you know that the underlying models and the outputs are safe and reliable? So there's just a number of things like that, that we, we've been advancing in the field. And Last year, we showed this really exciting results that came out. It was three articles that came out on the cover of Nature Medicine. It was a breakthrough result for the field. It was the first time ever shown basically trials where we conducted it across five hospitals. 4,400 clinicians were part of it. Almost three quarters of a million patients. So like very large study and over two and a half years. And this was a platform detecting patients at risk for this life-threatening condition called sepsis. So sepsis is this condition. It's like one of the leading causes of uh, deaths, um, more than um, you know, um, breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. And turns out in sepsis, like if you can identify the the most promising avenue for improving outcomes is identifying it early. But today, um, you know, we don't have high quality detection tests, and the tests we do have often rely on physicians to suspect it in the first place. So basically what we this was an eight year it took eight years to do this piece of work but it was an eight-year collaboration uh leveraging these state-of-the-art uh techniques but what we showed was like a system that could run in the background with existing infrastructure uh you know electronic health record infrastructure that pulls data automatically surveils and identifies and flags patients and makes it really really easy to um you know to identify closed gaps and treat and what we were able to show was almost, uh, you know, an 18% uh, you know, association of like 18% reductions in mortality from patients who received early identification and timely response and treatment compared to those who didn't. And it was pretty remarkable to see the data exists, the infrastructure exists, you know, how, and physicians will adopt if done in a way that like sort of fits. So we, we had a lot of learnings through that, you know, and that was, um, we had a lot of learnings through that work in terms of both starting to see that now it's possible, starting to see the number of different condition areas that's applicable, starting to understand how would you deliver it in a way that is safe and reliable, implementing it across systems in a way that can be done, not in a, you know, like a, a custom bespoke way where, you know, it's like a, a room of 50 people getting it done, but then there's no easy way to repeat it. Almost feels like now there's a scalable model. And uh, to me, what's most exciting is this kind of almost, I feel like the birth of a whole new category that's going to be led by AI here, which is historically we've had 
uh, blood-based diagnostics or chemistry-based diagnostics, right? Like when you look at most diagnostic tests, their blood, they're not, you know, it's an, like a, a, you're often sort of doing some lab processing. But here we're giving birth to this third category, which is going to be more machine learning driven software as a diagnostic. So it's basically integrating data that we already collected. We don't need new hardware, but it's entirely software based and it's bringing together all these disparate data. And it has a number of advantages compared to historical diagnostics in the sense that it's, um, it relies on data that exists, it's software, it, you can go to time to go to market is much shorter for software. You can embed it within systems in a way that you can really drive adoption compared to how people have been able to do it. So it's, I think it's very exciting to see. So that was a long answer. The short summary of it is, I think a lot has changed and we will see a lot more progress in the next um, three to five years from a commercial go to market perspective. And we're already seeing this in our own work from the results we showed to ne several new condition areas where we're seeing results to partnerships with health systems, where we're, uh, you know, where we, we've gone live and replicated results. Got it, like wonderful. One thing that we saw in Germany recently was that we were actually introducing the um, electronic me medical record and immediately the discussion around data privacy came up. Am I automatically opted in? Do I need to opt out? What's the thing? So what can we do to build trust in consumers or in patients so they are willing to give their data, especially in Europe and in Germany, I'm, I'm German, this is always a topic when we introduce new technologies, like, okay, what's the you know, data privacy aspect of it? How do you see that? Um, how can we win that fight? Yeah, I think, um, I think here, there's a lot, uh, I mean, certainly when we're looking at different countries and different cultures across the world, we're certainly seeing cultures where, you know, um, surveys show patients repeatedly say, uh, like for instance, in the US, this is on multiple different surveys, like they would be will, like, um, they'd be willing to share the data to see ben medical benefit. Um, uh, another one was they trust uh, care with AI to be less biased than care with just their physician. Um, so I think there's certainly, um, I actually think there's patient willingness, at least in the US. What is very interesting to me is like, there are also administrative organizations who see data as like a, an asset that they can monetize. And so in some sense, almost like, um, while the data belongs to the patients, they're often being controlled by the uh, healthcare delivery organization who are, you know, sort of uh, providing care. And then in some scenarios, it's become almost um, now a business model to monetize the data itself. Uh, personally, I think what we really need, um, I mean, this is a tricky topic, but I feel like education and really clean data use agreements, right? So if there's a way to very, very cleanly specify data use agreements that explain what is the data going to be used for and why and how, and that could be potentially certification organizations that help explain you know, different types of data use agreements and what does that all mean and what the implications are and allow consumers to, you know, better understand and participate, I think, um, and potentially distributed infrastructure for opt-in, opt-out, I think is uh, very, very interesting. But increasingly, um, we're seeing cultures get more comfortable with it, but it also feels to me like we didn't do ourselves service by have you know, when, you constantly hear of things in the press, right? Where organizations are primarily using the data as a way of monetizing, you know, selling the data itself, which I think is not great. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I feel caught because I work in marketing. I, I'm not doing this with the data, but you know, the, as soon as I say, you know, I work in digital marketing, I use data. It's like, are you using my data? What do you do? Are you sending me an ad I don't want? It's, it's immediately like this. And I could talk with you forever, but I see that Robert <laughs> has an urgent question. So Robert, yeah, what is it? Actually, I got a couple of them, but. <laughs> Uh, it's also said that AI uh, contributes to health care of health inequity. Uh, so there are a number of cases, for instance, in melanoma, uh, where melanoma diagnostic tools are not uh, diagnosing melanoma in the darker skin correctly, 
which leads to health inequity. What's your opinion on this? Yeah, I think um, I think this is it's so important for us as we deploy solutions for them to be rigorously validated and properly evaluated. The example uh, that you're describing is one of many where, you know, people get euphoric. They're not thinking as hard about like, is the solution well tested, rigorously validated in all sorts of subgroups and subpopulations and not just kind of relying on a biased data set. Um, interestingly, you know, there's countless studies showing like ways in which human practice today is biased. So if you just take data generated as a byproduct of human practice and all you do is mimic existing practice, which is you know something machine learning AI can be good at doing if you train it to do that, then essentially you're gonna end up training systems or algorithms that are sort of mimicking human bias and are as a result biased. Um, but I feel like changing human behavior is so much harder than changing machine behavior. Maybe it's because I've studied in the field for so long, I feel like you know changing machines is easier but you can actually design mathematical algorithms to debias data to debias um, um, you know and there are a number of mitigation mitigation strategies now so in that example that you described they made the mistake of sort of collecting a data set which was very heavily focused on you know white male and not yeah, that's enough in to the te that's in the textbooks well, the exactly. textbook describes, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, but, uh, you know, but in the textbooks there is like, okay, melanoma is pre predominantly in, uh, the, in the light skin, but in the darker skin. So this initial start is, in my opinion, already wrong. Um, I think one thing that I found very interesting in working with the FDA over the last several years is sort of how they think about safety and um, evaluation really appeals to me. So when you try to release a new piece of software or a, you know, or for instance, a drug or a device, you often have this notion of a label, like when is it safe to use? What is the indication for use? What are you trying to do with it? Who is the intended population? And where is your data supporting safety and efficacy? That's interesting because you could imagine in the example you described, it's possible that we today only have enough data to be effective in a sub, in a subpopulation of like let's say um, you know younger white um, uh, Caucasian uh, populations, and if that's the case, then you could just and let's say it so turns out that this disease is um, you know perhaps prevalent in multiple groups, but we just have the data to support use within a certain group. Then at least in the very worst case when you're introducing a device, you can introduce a label or a claim with it that says it works well in this population, but not is not indicated for use in any other population, which now creates at least doesn't promote misuse, which is, you know, people don't under detect, under diagnose or over detect, over treat by virtue of having solutions that aren't validated, right, in certain populations. A more, but, philosoph yeah, a more philosophical question uh, is, will AI replace a medical doctor? medical doctors. I think or, there are definitely uh, let, let's, let me rephrase it. Um, would I um, encourage my kid to go to med school? Yeah, I, my take on this is, I mean, I think there are certainly medical areas where um, the tasks that physicians do today can be done more efficiently and more effectively with AI. Mm -hmm. So I think it isn't that AI will replace doctors, it's more that AI will change the roles of doctors, right? So many, you know, I've worked around uh, like clinicians, many physicians, clinicians often go into medicine in the first place because they love caring for patients, you know, that's sort of the driving force. And so by virtue of having tools like AI helping them, kind of removing some of the administrivia, removing all the hundreds of clicks they have to do searching for information, integrating lots of historical longitudinal information to make it easy and faster for them to pinpoint what the issue is so that they can sort of focus more on the, and now what? So given this is the case, so what do we do? Communicating, uh, helping understand like what the options are and, and why and what the risks and benefits are. So I see, I see scenarios, I mean, um, Bayesian for instance is very focused on what we call intelligent care augmentation, building co-pilots for care teams in order to help them deliver care that is more uh, efficient and effective um, and giving, you know, improving frontline experience. Like, um, 
so I think uh, it'll be exciting to see how this role changes. The hard part will be obviously changing and bringing medical schools along to be able to integrate this new type of technology and education to start, you know, like we were fearful of calculators, right? Like I went to school yeah. in India, I had to do all arithmetic by hand. Calculators came along and then you had to, you had to learn how to use a TI-82. So basically, I think it's something very similar. They're just new tools. If you use it well, you're going to be way more efficient and effective. It may be slightly off topic, but uh, shouldn't we uh, uh, equip specialized nurses with AI tools so they can basically become the, take the position that the doctors currently have? I think the whole care team's role is going to evolve, right? There are different, how they coordinate, how they look and hunt for information, who does what, whether it's done in a hospital setting or at home setting or on like by chat, like, you know, um, so I think the answer sadly is not as simple as, you know, replace X by Y, but it's just reimagining care delivery, right? Like the, there's going to be a grand reimagine and it's going to be really, really fun. We're already starting to see that with some of the work we do. And, um, and other examples are scenarios where, you know, historically there were tests run by specialists. Now you can use data, to, uh, AI to automate it. So like one area is diabetic retinopathy. You'd have to go to an ophthalmologist, but now you can basically, um, they have new automated tests that you can, that, you know, in a simple device that runs in a primary care physician's office. So you don't have to go to the specialist. That device can do, you know, it's a fully autonomous AI that like takes your, the image of your retina, does an automated analysis for whether you're at risk for diabetic retinopathy. And then if you are, provide follow on recommendations for what to do next. Historically, you'd have to be, you know, you'd have to wait for an appointment, you'd have to get a referral to a specialist, you'd have to go to the specialist and so on and so forth, and it was very expensive. Great example of something that's already in motion today. Yeah. Marcus, yes. you have another question. Yes. Um, Suchi, cost of healthcare is a big issue, not only in the US, but I guess everywhere around, uh, around the world. Now, is AI decreasing the cost and you know, makes you know, great treatment available to everyone in this world? Or will it increase the cost and kind of you know, create a two-tier kind of society? What's your stake on that? Yeah, I very firmly believe that AI will dramatically reduce cost. Done right. The done right is very important because obviously it has to be integrated in a way that makes sense. I can already see many examples today of already pockets of examples where we're seeing this. Let me go back to the work Bayesian is doing. Um, we're working with both large and small health systems, even community hospitals where, you know, they don't have a huge amount of money to spill around. These are not like, in a, you know, systems where they're investing gobs and gobs of money to be innovative, to do like things like shiny object investments. These are very practical systems. They have to measure results, they have to show, and they have, they don't, you know, they have three, two, three percent margin. So there's not like a whole lot of room to play around. Simple example. There are a number of these condition areas, including sepsis, where, you know, if you can do early detection, you can actually like, um, you know, the cost of care for that patient is a lot sm smaller because, you know, the later, you know, the sicker they get, the more things you need to do to them, the more it costs to take care of them. And turns out these hospitals get paid a fixed amount. So if you're basically getting paid a fixed amount, but you're doing a lot more in a scenario under standard of care where you don't have access to these tools versus if you're able to use these tools to be much more effective in managing better care, well, not only are you providing better care, it's also way more cost effective. You're able to get the patient out much sooner from your hospital compared to like them being there longer. The cost of care downstream is lower because they're lower risk for readmission. They're lower, they have fewer needs for downstream care. So the payers benefit, right? And I'm just giving you one example. There are a number of these kinds of uh, areas where, uh, you know, by better utilizing by anticipating, you know, moving from sort of a reactive to much more of an anticipatory system, you can start to optimize care where you're not only just improving outcomes, but lowering utilization and cutting waste. Um, the diabetic retinopathy example was another one, right? Historically, you'd go to a specialist. It was extremely expensive. It would delay when you were likely to get that um, um, screening in the first place. 
because it was inconvenient. It was difficult. Many people wouldn't want to go to the specialist. But now if you can just get that screening done in the primary care doctor's office, well, it turns out it's fully autonomous. It's priced to be way cheaper than what the specialist would have charged. You can do it at lower cost. It's easier, it's earlier, and it's much easier to treat and uh, resolve when you do early detection. So number of examples, I could probably go on and on, but I am very firmly in the... Uh, I would love to. I would love to continue talking to you for hours because it's so interesting, actually. And I, was, I would love to touch more topics and what hospitals think about it. And if insurances love you and hospitals don't like you when you do the preventive mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, well, I, I don't know, but there's so much to discuss. Um, but I would love to ask you for a, a sentence uh, for us entrepreneurs, uh, one key takeaway. What would it be? <laughs> I happen to, I think there's just so much to do. There's so much exciting opportunity in meaningful domains to me make measurable impact. But there's also a lot of hype surrounding AI. This is like what I would call almost the third hype cycle in my own <laughs> time of working in the field. Every time there's a hype cycle, it's very distracting because a lot of investments go in, they go in the wrong directions. They consume a lot of minds. And now that we have Twitter, it's even more easy to be very consumed, right? And I think the only thing I have to say is find a community of people who are real and like build, test, solve, learn. It's so much like, you know, those are the key things that matter. It's so much easier to speculate. And, you know, like so much of Twitter is like so wildly speculative, often coming from people who've never, you know, who are not who are not part of the solution, you know? So um, anyway, yeah. I think there's a lot to do. It's like, you know, we're in a privileged position where we're like early stages of an explosive. I mean, it's again, the third inning, but it's like, it has shown such consistent progress and will continue to accelerate. So it's a great awesome. time to focus and build and learn and test. Wonderful. That was a wonderful last statement. Thank you so much, Suchi, uh, for joining us here today. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Suchi Saria. Um, you could contact her on LinkedIn. I would love to continue, but we need to head back to, to the, the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>